I'm here today to talk to you about privacy and the GDPR. <coughs> and at this point, I'm going to choose to reveal some personal information. <coughs> I'm Marcus Boynton. I'm the technical director of Synchromedia Limited. I'm responsible for writing smartmessages.net, which is a email marketing system. And uh, I've had a lot of exposure to data protection issues as part of that. And I'm also the maintainer of PHP Mailer. Um, and there's a good story about that tomorrow if you want to hear more about uh, security holes and being on the wrong side of them. <coughs> so um, first up, uh, how did we get to this point where we are in the history of data protection? <coughs> well, it all started really back in 1995, this catchily named 95-46-EC. slash um, was an EU directive that uh, applied to all EU member countries. And because it was a directive, that meant that each EU member state had to enact its own set of laws that conformed to this set of guidelines that formed the directive. So in the UK, for example, that formed the UK Data Protection Act in 98. And they had similar legislation in France and so on. Now, this was all about storing data on EU citizens in the EU. And of course, data travels outside the EU. Um, but the EU was still concerned about how that data was handled, um, particularly when data was transferred to the US. And so in 2000, they set up a scheme called Safe Harbor. And the idea behind Safe Harbor was that American companies storing data on EU citizens could store their stuff in the US under the auspices of the EU directive. So it would maintain the same level of data protection standards, um, but actually still holding the data in the US. Now. Um, <coughs> Then a certain Mr. Snowden came along and told us what the NSA were up to. And in the wake of that, Max Schrems, a uh, Austrian law student, uh, decided that he wasn't very happy with the way that this was all being handled. So he sued Facebook in Ireland. Um, he com made a complaint to the Data Protection Commissioner in Ireland saying that Facebook were holding his data, uh, taking his data in the EU and holding it in Ireland, which is why the case was brought there and then they were exporting it to the US under safe harbor. However, because of what the NSA were doing, particularly just indiscriminate mass surveillance, it meant that that data was no longer being stored um, up to the same level of, um, of integrity and standards that the safe harbor agreement was expecting. And so the safe harbor agreement was really no longer legitimate and, and uh, wasn't doing what it was supposed to do. So the court agreed with him and it died. And from that point onwards, it was actually illegal to store data on EU citizens in the US. So all those thousands of online services um, it, it couldn't do really very much. And they were really left sort of hung out to dry. However, nobody was really sued over it because they knew that it was so significant that something had to be done. And not surprisingly, it was. And there was a new, new development, a thing called Privacy Shield came along in July last year. And Privacy Shield really patched up a lot of the, the problems with Safe Harbor. Safe Harbor was pretty old by this point anyway. You know, It was, what, 15 years old um, and hadn't really uh, dealt with a lot of the things that had happened in the, in the world of the web and communications in general. Um, but unfortunately, it really still suffers the same fundamental issues that there's not really anything that they can do about what the NSA is up to. And so it's very likely that Privacy Shield will also collapse, possibly done by Max Schrems again. He's, uh, he's gunning for them. <laughs> um, anyway, you, the Privacy Shield scheme is, is a voluntary thing that company, American companies can register for. So if you want to find out if your data is being handled correctly according to this scheme, you can go onto the Privacy Shield website, look up company, and check that they have actually registered um, and that they are guaranteeing that your data is handled in that, that uh, correct way. Meanwhile, <coughs> The problem with this uh, EU directive is that because it was implemented by each EU member state, although it was the same overall set of guidelines, the implementations actually varied quite a lot. So the UK's Data Protection Act is actually a really easy read. It's a really nicely written bit of legislation. Um, it's easy to understand and so on. But fundamentally, it's really pretty slack. You can get away with an awful lot in the UK that you can't get away with in other bits of the EU. Um, and this kind of inconsistency uh, really didn't help. Um, things were much stricter in Germany and Spain. Um, and you know, in, in Spain, uh, I think someone actually went to prison for sending one email. Uh, it, 
things got quite serious in places, and there were some big fines and so on as well. So uh, this whole inconsistency thing really needed to be uh, patched up. And this is where the GDPR comes in. <coughs> now, <coughs> sorry. This is um, the, the fundamental difference, really, is that this is a regulation and not a directive. And the difference between those is that they're not subject to implementation by each EU member state. Uh, it's a set of laws that are formulated right from the top, and they apply equally across all, you, all EU member states. That's not to say that individual states aren't free to uh, produce legislation which sits on top of that, and several countries are already doing that. Germany has already got stuff uh, in hand, um, maybe clarifying some fine details with particular respect to the German um, uh, market. Um, and it completely replaces the, the previous directive. It's not in addition to it. It's actually a full replacement. It was actually adopted in April 2016, but it will be enforced from the 25th of May um, next year, which is also my birthday. But there's a, another, exit, exit, uh, another piece of personal data that has escaped into the world. <coughs> but it was with my consent. <coughs> the UK government has said that they will support it, whatever happens with Brexit. Um, and this re they don't really have any choice in the matter because if they don't support the GDPR, they're not going to be able to do any business at all in the, in the whole of the EU. So uh, there's not a lot of choice there. Um, much like the previous directive, it's actually largely concerned with protecting the rights of the individual, very much so in, in favour of the individual over uh, the rights of companies and governments. Um, one of the things that's been talked about an awful lot is the fines that can be levied. Uh, under the UK Data Protection Act, uh, the, the biggest fine that you can have at the moment is half a million pounds, um, which is not that great an incentive for, for quite a lot of big companies that they go, oh, well, it's the cost of doing business kind of thing. Um, and um, you know, the, the likes of Google and Facebook are not, are not really that worried about the, that kind of level of fine. So they've had to come up with something that's a little bit more aggressive. And the fines, the levels have been increased, and they're now up to 20 million euros or 4% of global turnover, um, whichever is the greater. Uh, so that's a, that's a pretty big deal. The other thing is that that is per incident. It's not like per year. You can't kind of get a bundle deal. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so for example, um, under the, the, uh, the previous legislation, Talk Talk, which is a, <coughs> a mobile operator in the UK, they lost data on about 150,000 people, um, their, their customers, and they were fined 400,000 pounds for doing that. So bearing in mind that they also lost about 20 million pounds worth of business, uh, the, the fine doesn't really figure that much in it, um, but it's some, certainly something they'd want to avoid. Um, similarly, Tesco's bank lost, uh, well, they, they had a security breach, and they had two and a half million pounds stolen from, uh, from 9,000 um, uh, of their accounts. Uh, they had to pay all that back, and they also got a, a, some trifling fine relative to the actual exposure. But under the GDPR, their fine would have been about 1.9 billion. Um, now, with that kind of fines sort of lurking behind the scenes, there's a big incentive for the bigger companies to really start paying more attention to this uh, and taking it much more seriously. Now, because of this emphasis on the rights of the individual, there's been a lot of kind of concern. And this was a quote, it's a couple of quotes from an article on, uh, on LinkedIn. Um, it's, this really applies to companies that make their money out of tracking users, um, mostly without their consent. This is basically, this is a message for them. It's, you're gonna have a hard time. If you make your, if your business is based on tracking people, um, and extracting data from them and mining it and, and cutting it this, that way and the other and more to the point, selling it on to other people. That's something that you're going to have trouble continuing to do. Now, <coughs> part of this idea of, of uh, trying to get away from this thing is that there's been this long habit of basically treating your database like this and just you just keep everything, stuff things in every available corner, and you find if you go and look at your database, you're bound to find little bits of it going like, what's this data? Where did it come from? Why have we got it? <coughs> um, why are we still keeping it? <coughs> you know, what resources are we spending to maintain this data that's actually useless? And more to the point, is possibly actually toxic. 
<coughs> you know, there could be uh, some kind of exposure if, if this data was, was leaked out when we don't even need it. That, you know, why are we keeping it? We need to get rid of this kind of stuff. So this, this stuff has to stop. At any point, bear in mind that an information commissioner can come along and go, um, we found this item of data in your database. And if you can't tell me where it came from and why you've got it, I'll fine you. And the same applies to every other item that I find in your database. So you need to be able to answer those questions. And if you can't, you need to get rid of the data. So from that point of view, GDPR really isn't quite like a lot of other compliance standards for, uh, for data protection, like HIPAA in the US or PCI um, in most of the world. It's not really something that you can easily outsource. It really requires a cultural change in the whole way that you handle data within an organization. So fundamentally, it's built on a set of data protection principles. And the first of these, uh, well, th these are actually largely the same as the, as the things that we used in the earlier directive, but they've just been clarified and strengthened in various ways. And the most significant one really is their first one, is that processing should be lawful, fair, and transparent. And the really big change is actually that last word, the transparency. Not only must you be able to say, yes, we are compliant, we are handling your data in this way, but you actually have to be able to demonstrate it as well. Um, that's actually a legal requirement. You can be asked at any point to show exactly how you're making these things um, that your processing is lawful, fair, and transparent. Um, so that's a really significant thing. Um, data that you collect and process must be for specific, explicitly stated, and legitimate purposes. You can't just go like, well, we, we just want your address. You know, we just, we, you know there, was a, there was a gap. Um, uh, you, you can't just go and just kind of try and cherry pick random bits of data off people and, and just uh, because it might possibly be useful in future because once you've got that data it's then potentially toxic and you, you don't really want to have data that you can't account for its uh, provenance for. Um, the data you collect needs to be adequate, relevant, and limited to the stated purposes that you're collecting it for. So say for example, the adequacy is, is a, a straightforward practical thing. Um, if you're going to deliver somebody a parcel, then you're going to need their address. Uh, without that, it would be inadequate and inappropriate. But similarly, just because you've got their address to deliver a parcel doesn't mean that you can send someone around to their house later or send them some other stuff or sell their address to somebody else. Um, the, you know, the, there's a sort of an air, an air of reasonableness around a lot of this, although you can be sure that a lot of advertisers and so on will try and squeeze through some little hole somewhere. <laughs> um, that you should store the data no longer than necessary. So how long is necessary? Well, a simple example, say somebody's bought something from you and it has a guarantee, you would want to keep it for at least as long as that guarantee period so that if they come back to you, that you actually remember that they bought it from you. Um, and there may be other constraints on keeping data. For example, there might be uh, tax or insurance or accounting laws that you need to comply with um, that are in addition to the, the, the rights of the individual. Um, once you've got this data, you need to make sure that you handle it correctly. You don't want to mess it up. Um, so a, a classic example here would be messing up character encodings. Um, you know, someone's got an accent in their name and it suddenly turns into a random string of, of, of rubbish. That's not the kind of thing you want to do. You need to make sure that you maintain integrity of the data that you've been capturing. Um, you also want to make sure that only the people that should be able to access it can access it. Um, so this set, of, this set of principles, we can kind of spread them out over a sort of a spectrum of <coughs> of sort of user-facing, uh, sort of like in, almost interface type things, right through to sort of classic pure IT concerns. So up front, we've really got things about notifying users that you are going to collect data, give them the choice to opt out from things. You know, it, for example, if you're proposing to get this data and sell it on to somebody else, that they must be given the opportunity to, to say no. Um, and you also need to tell them how it is actually going to be used once they've uh, obtained this data from you. Um, as a layer on top of that, which are adding a sort of a, to a, a layer of technical um, uh, elements over the top of that, is confidentiality and controlling access to it. So that's that's just doing basic things like using HTTPS and having um, reliable authentication. Um, 
right on the sort of the, the pure IT concerns really is just making sure that the stuff is actually available for use in the way it's supposed to be used and that again you don't corrupt it in some way um, either by you know, moving it around incorrectly or by losing data through not backing up properly um, anything like that so these concerns are kind of spread across the, a range of disciplines from from user interface design to um, sort of database redundancy and backup so managing this transition over the next 11 months, <laughs> uh, the things that you're going to have to bear in mind are really that, for the most part, things haven't actually changed an awful lot. The basic principles are still the same. Um, they're just better and more strongly worded. Um, the, uh, so if you've been doing things right under the, the previous directive, you shouldn't actually have that much to worry about. Um, but if you've been kind of living on the edge of those those things in the directive, then you're probably going to fall off unless you move. Um, really, the, the biggest change is the accountability. You need to be able, because you need to demonstrate compliance. You've got to keep much better records of things like uh, where you got data from, um, and that's something that was not always. Uh, not always done and a classic example I encounter doing email marketing stuff is that someone comes up and they've got an email they've got a mailing list and it's like okay where did this list come from how do the people get onto it and they go oh yeah honestly it was all double opt-in you go okay where's your proof and they kind of look at you blankly uh, because one of the problems here is that the the, the marketing industry like the, the DMA and so on has been all very, but having a very public face about going, oh yes, you know, we approve that all this stuff should be collected legitimately. But as soon as it comes to actually imposing any kind of rigorous uh, process or proof to any of this kind of stuff, they're extremely resistant to doing so. Uh, so the GDPR really tries to address this information asymmetry that these companies, like if we, if Facebook is a key example here, they know an awful lot about you, but you really don't know very much about them. And you, it's hard to find out who you need to approach, what processes you need to go through in order to obtain access to your data. Um, like doing things like even, even finding things that you've posted previously on your timeline on Facebook is actually really quite difficult. There is actually a place you can go to, but I had to go and search for how to find it uh, and so on. So that information is there a lot of the time, but it's often quite difficult to access. Um, these things need to be made straightforward and clear. To make all this work, it really helps to have defined procedures for all of this, um, especially if you're talking about bigger problems like data breaches. If, in, what would happen in your company if someone walked into your database, grabbed the whole lot and dumped it on a site somewhere? You know, what would you do in that situation? And that's obviously a kind of the worst case scenario, but it happens. You've seen haveibeenpwned.com. That's, that's what happens. There's a lot of bad publicity and a lot of upset people and a lot of damaged people. Um, you know, people have killed themselves over data leaks. Um, it's, it's serious stuff. Um, but however, it's, although it's easy to get excited about these big things like data breaches and disaster recovery, um, it's really, there's lots of other smaller things like having a decent password policy, um, how you do your logging, how you do your backups, keeping audit trails of things. All of these things need demonstrable procedures as well. Um, and the only way that you can really handle that is that you've got to dog food it. You've got to use your own, these same principles on the stuff that you do every day. Um, my master's thesis in 93 uh, was all about how if you're going to get people to conform to a set of uh, guidelines and things, the only way to make it happen is to build it into the tools. So just like now we use sort of continuous integration, continuous um, deployments and so on, you, you need to make sure that you use those kind of procedures, that you need a continuous privacy monitoring, continuous data protection monitoring in much the same kind of way. You need to build these things into the process so they're things that you should, don't need to think about anymore because if you need to think about them to get them done, they won't get done. Um, and because they won't get done, you won't have the accountability that you need should you ever be asked to provide it. GDPR's suggestion for how to handle this is what they call privacy by design. So this is really a whole kind of corporate empathy thing, uh, which is a slightly difficult uh, concept. 
But the, the idea really is that you need to put yourself in the user's position. If you were that user, how would you want your data handled? You know, when, when you sign up for this thing, did you actually ask to have your data given to some third party on the other side of the world who has no, no regard for your, uh, your privacy at all? Um, so you need to, uh, to look at it from their point of view. You need to empathize. Um, right back at the start of the whole thing, not something that you try and bolt on afterwards. Though, of course, we're now in a situation, if you've got existing services, you have to kind of take a step back. Um, and design level changes can be uh, difficult and expensive. So if you have a nice agile um, development system at the moment, then this should pay off. <laughs> um, you need to just make sure that you, you do keep records of everything um, to facilitate the accountability. Now, um, there are various actually kind of names for some of the procedures involved in all this. And the first of these really is the Privacy Impact Assessment, or the PIA. They're, they're, but this being legislation, they're keen on uh, acronyms. Um, so say, uh, you, say you have some proposed change to your, to your service. Say that uh, you're going to make it so that when people log into your system, it provides a list of all the people that are currently logged in with their phone numbers because that's going to make it really easy for them to talk to each other. It's going to be great. Uh, so you might do a privacy impact assessment on this, going, okay, well, how would this, how would this development, this idea, how would that impact their privacy? And you might quite quickly come to the conclusion that it was actually a bad idea uh, and you don't really want to go leaking all their data like that. Um, now. This is where it becomes clear. There's a lot of overlap between privacy and data protection, but they're not the same thing. Privacy is something that is, uh, is a fundamental right. It's encapsulated in the um, European uh, Convention on Human Rights. And it's something, it's things like your right to a private life and, and so on. These are things that are, are kind of fundamental um, rights that are beyond what's in the GDPR and so on. Um, but they're, they're really about the sort of the conceptual things about how, how this relates to you as a person. Whereas data protection is much more about the implementation of those things. Essentially, you're going to have a hard time guaranteeing privacy if you can't guarantee data protection. But the other way around isn't necessarily true. So the next thing we have is, of course, data protection impact assessments. So here, this is, this is much more about uh, the sort of the whole compliance thing. So an example of a scenario here might be that if you're going to make a change relating to a user's data, how, how does that change interfere with a user's ability to see their own data, for example? Um, um, so you need to make sure that, so, oh, we're going we're gonna to add this field to the database. It's like, OK, so we need to add it to the display of stuff. Oh, we need to make it so that the users can actually log in and see this data that's stored about them, so it needs to be added there as well. Those are the kind of things that you need to think about in the data protection side of things. And there's also the, the, the concern is like, well, why are we collecting this data? You know, um, how long are we going to keep it for? Again, it's this, these same questions over again, really. So it's all just process, process. There's a possible need to have somebody that's actually formally responsible for, for controlling all this. Because bearing in mind, that it, it needs to span a lot of disciplines. You need to go from people designing the stuff on the front end to implementing things in the database um, and uh, to other pure IT concerns like um, where do your backups go? You know, for example, you might be based in the EU. Your backups are happening in the US. It's like, oh, you just exported their data. Um, so it's like, oh, well, we can do that. Maybe we should encrypt the backups. That might be a good idea. Um, now, again, this is one of the areas, much like the fines, where there's been a lot of hype and sort of misinformation going around. Lots of people going, oh, it's terrible. You've got to have a full-time data protection officer. Um, that's not true. Um, there are some circumstances where you do have to have one, but that's typically um, in places where, um, for example, public authorities, so tax offices, police forces, um, government departments, these are people that will need to have uh, a full-time DPO. Um, and also people that are um, making a habit of tracking people. So for example, that might include me. Uh, <laughs> because we do do some elements of user tracking, for example, open and click tracking, um, though we've made it entirely optional and opt-outable um, for many years. <laughs> um, and um, those handling data that falls into what's classified as, as uh, sensitive categories. 
Now, the other thing about a DPO is it's actually entirely feasible to outsource that as a role. And there are several agencies and companies that will give you a kind of a, a part-time or a, a sort of a you know a certain hours per month of a of a data protection officer, so that they can you can accumulate a set of circumstances that you want them to pay attention to and have them ship that off um, to the data protection officer and have them assess how that might be handled within your company. So I mentioned these sensitive data things. Data is in several flavors as far as the GDPR is concerned. The middle column there is the is the most obvious thing, really. So it's your name address, anything that can be tied to you as an individual. Um, but because of the way that uh, things have been going on the web, a lot of these unique identifiers are slightly more subtle. So it's things like your IP address. Um, and one thing that happened actually uh, I think earlier this year or the end of last year was in Germany they upheld that dynamic IP addresses should also be considered personal data if it's combined with a timestamp because you can then, then establish exactly who had control of that IP address at the time. Um, so IP addresses are a, a bigger factor, particularly with the advent of IP version 6 because that tends to be a little bit uh, um, more traceable because essentially there's no need for things like natting anymore and everybody and everything can get their own um, IPv6 address. I don't know if you know this, but 4G mobile networks are natively IPv6 throughout. Um, so that's happening everywhere if you're on, on a 4G mobile. Um, there are some nasty things going on with browser fingerprinting, some incredibly subtle things going on with that. Uh, like for example, you can be identified pretty clearly with um, like the list of fonts that are available in your browser. Uh, another one I heard of was um, with the audio interfaces available through JavaScript, is they can take a, if they can take a, a spectrum of the ambient background noise, you don't even have to be speaking or anything, just a spectrum of the background noise, that's also a fairly unique identifier. Um, these, there's some lots of really subtle things that all these advertisers are doing that they're just so dodgy. You really don't want to go there, and hopefully the GDPR will clear a lot of the, clear up a lot of this misbehaviour. Now, one of the ways that you can get away from some of the regulation and try and avoid falling into some of these traps of even holding this kind of data is to anonymise this data. So, uh, a really good example of that is um, that, that I've run into is we maintain email suppression lists, which is where somebody signed up for something and then later on they decide actually no, I want to unsubscribe. So we save, we remove them from the mailing list, but we need to save the fact that they have unsubscribed from this list. The thing is, typically in order to do that, you need to keep their email address. So you've got this kind of counterintuitive thing. It's like, well, we need to keep your data to not use it. Um, this seems like a, a, a very strange thing to do. Um, but a workaround for that is instead of storing the email address itself, you can save a hash of it. And that means that because you use a decent hash, fun hash function, it's not going to be reversible. You can't figure out their email address from the hash. So you can then safely throw away the email address and know that if that email address comes back into the system again, you can, you can make the hash of it, check it against your suppression list and go, uh, no, we're not going to send to that address again. Um, similarly, IP addresses. The thing is IP addresses, they tend to leak everywhere. Classic example, web server logs. They're going to be there for months, if not years, uh, in many cases. I mean, you cycle your logs and so on, but you know, then it gets pushed into an Elk stack and it's gone into some database on the other side of the world. And it's like, how are we going to clear those IP addresses out when uh, when they're considered personal data? And did we get permission before we shift, ship them off there? Um, this becomes difficult. Uh, um, so you can truncate IP addresses, say lop the bottom 16 bits off um, of an IPv4 address, and that will kind of give you like a, a rough country or something which is anonymous enough. Um, data in that third column, sensitive data. Now this is where if you're handling this stuff you need to have a DPO relating to, to handling it. It's anything where it could be potentially damaging for this, this information to be revealed. Uh, or, also, or, the, or that it just has serious consequences. So for example, having biometric or genetic data leaked is not something you can really unleak because you can't, you can't change it. You, know, you can't change your iris scan. It's very hard to change your fingerprints. Um, changing your genetic makeup, well, uh, there are certain therapies, I believe, but uh, <laughs> it's not exactly an easy thing to do. Um, and so it's the kind of thing that you really want to keep protected as much as possible. Um, but there are lots of other more basic things like uh, political affiliation, um, sexual orientation and so on that people really don't want to have spread around. So 
the, there are a whole load of additional requirements under the GDPR if you handle data relating to anything in this sensitive category. But the best approach really is that if you don't have it, you don't need to worry about it. So don't capture it, don't store it. Just avoid that kind of data if at all possible. Now, on top of the, the D GDPR, which is of course a data protection regulation, as I mentioned, it's slightly distinct from, from privacy regulations. Um, and exactly like GDPR, there is a previous directive relating to privacy, um, and there's, that's being entirely replaced with an e-privacy regulation, which in much the same way, it's applied equally across all EU member states. Um, and you'll be glad to know that this spells the end of the cookie law. Uh, now that, that little uh, dialogue there, that's actually off the UK Information Commissioner's own website. Um, and is a, an off-the-shelf uh, cookie um, dialogue thing. So yeah, this is fine. Now, the thing is that they really, everybody hated this. Users hated it, developers hated it, and uh, there are like a million different implementations and they interfere with your browsing and they mean that you like can't get to your navigation controls on your phone and it, it's just, they're just really irritating. It's just the wrong way to do it. And this is why going back to the thing in GDPR of um, privacy by design, this stuff needs to be baked in right from the earliest point. Well, the thing is that the earliest point isn't really the website, it's the browsers. And because of that, they're having much more emphasis on getting browser makers to implement these privacy controls so that they apply uniformly across all websites. Now, um, the best example of this really actually is um, Safari. Um, right from the start, Safari didn't allow third-party cookies. Um, and lots of advertising um, companies were really quite upset about this and were going on about blocking Safari and so on. Um, but in fact, what's happened since then is that other browsers have reluctantly gone, okay, we'll do that as well. Um, and so this, these kind of controls in uh, inside browsers are going to get more comprehensive and give users more control. Um, and the one at the bottom here, website tracking, ask websites not to track me. This is related to an HTTP header called do not track or DNT. And this is actually scheduled to become legally enforceable. It's considered to be a binding contract that when you visit a site with that header set that you must not, con uh, must not track that person. Um, and that's quite a serious thing for, for a lot of sites. And again, all the advertising companies are getting very upset about this, um, but that's their problem. <laughs> um, right, um, and it's all subject to the same level of fines as the as the GDPR is. Now, this all this stuff it, it isn't um, it isn't just applicable to um, web stuff. It applies to all electronic communications. Um, so it also covers what goes on in phones and in cars and texts and all kinds of metadata linked to all these different media. So you have some personal rights that are meant to be guaranteed by the GDPR. But one of the things is that consent is actually not always required. And again, this is one of the things that you're seeing a lot of hype in the press going, you've got to ask consent for everything. Um, that's not actually true. If you're not collecting some critical pieces of data, you don't necessarily have to ask all the same questions. Um, but um, uh, if you're required by law to keep certain kinds of data or to collect and keep certain kinds of data, for example, if you're a tax office or, in fact, actually, if you're a government, you're given certain exemptions from doing this, although I believe they're not being exempted from fines. There's been some case in, in Ireland about that just recently um, where they were trying to exempt government departments from their obligations under GDPR and, and the courts were kind of going, no. <laughs> you've, got to, you've got to play nice just like everyone else. Um, uh, you have to have subject access. So data, data subjects are all of us as individuals. Um, you need, if, you're, if you have an account on a system somewhere, you must be able to log into your account and to see all the information that you've <coughs> stored, about it, uh, stored about yourself. On, um, on my own mailing list system, this is something I implemented about 10 years ago. Um, where anybody that's ever been sent an email from the system, not just our account holders, but people that are actually sent stuff, anybody that's ever been sent something from us can log into our site and see all the data that's stored about them and edit it and delete it as they like. Um, because 
editing your data and being able to erase your data are also fundamental rights under GDPR. You've got to allow people to do that. Now, strictly speaking, you don't necessarily have to let them edit stuff live on your site. You can have a procedure where they can write you a letter to ask you to do it. Um, and in theory, you're actually allowed to charge some nominal fee for processing, although I think that may have been removed, I'm not entirely certain. Um, in, in, the, uh, in the UK, there's been a long history of being able to do things like request your own credit report um, for a sort of a £10 fee or something, um, which is quite interesting if you've never done it. Um, so you can also object to marketing use. Um, so say, yeah, I'm, I'm signing up to your service, but don't send me stuff. Um, and you can also restrict the processing of, uh, of your data, like how it's going to be used, where it's going to be used, what purposes is it going to be used for. So just because you signed up to you know, adopt a donkey or something doesn't mean that you're going to um, send someone else lots of money for something else. Um, another right, which is actually uh, slightly surprising possibly, is um, there's, you need to guarantee portability of data. Um, now this means that you can download data relating to yourself or the, the group of people that you're administering or something in a, in a specific, they actually say explicitly that it needs to be in a machine readable format. So it's going to be something like CSV, XML, JSON or something like that. Um, so that it can be reasonably easily processed um, while maintaining its integrity um, and uploaded into some other service. So to provide you with the ability to move data around like that. Um, a good example of asking for uh, rights of, of things, I thought, was the location services dialog in, um, in iOS. So here you've got really quite fine control over what these apps can do. Um, and one that I was actually a little peeved about was this Handshake app, which is being promoted here. It requires always on data, and I think that's really not that good an idea. Um, and it doesn't provide the opportunity to allow you to choose the while using um, option. Whereas even, you know, even Google Maps doesn't say always. And these are, these are the prime data grabbers. <laughs> so, all right, another obligation on GDPR, you've got to report data breaches. Um, data breaches need to be reported to the country's data protection commissioner, and you've got to do it within 72 hours of finding out about it. Um, although it's a little bit more relaxed if your data is encrypted, because uh, obviously there's much, much lower impact if the data isn't actually readable. Um, or not, not easily readable anyway. Um, if your data breach includes sensitive data, you're also obliged to notice, notify the subjects individually. And there are fines for the breaches, not surprisingly, but there are also fines for not reporting breaches. And because the very nature of breaches means that people are very likely to find out about it, um, because it'll be on haviviandpwn.com, <laughs> um, uh, you'd be liable for a double hit on the on the fine if you tried to get away with it. So um, yeah, so that's just a, a useful thing to know. So some examples of kind of data protection and uh, situations. Uh, so someone signs up for your service and uh, when they do that you create, you call an API which pushes a record into their, into your CRM system so that you can track their purchases and so on in future. But then at some point later on they cancel the account on your system, um, but you leave the data in the CRM. So you'll end up with this kind of orphan data hanging around. And there's a potential there for sort of going like, well, we've got this data in our CRM, but we don't know where it came from because they don't have an account anymore. Um, so you need to, to make sure there are processes going both ways, not just for pushing data in, but also for clearing it out. Facebook like buttons. Um, and anything that uses, the, okay, this comes back to the third party cookies thing, that a lot of people kind of go, oh, we're not tracking them. It's not us that's doing the tracking, it's the third parties, it's the advertisers that are doing it. We're not setting the cookies. Well, tough, that's not really gonna be a valid argument um, uh, for much longer. Um, I say advertisers are gonna have a hard time with this, really. Uh, so if you don't like being spammed and all the millions of ads on, on the web pages, then you know where this is going. <laughs> Uh, Google Analytics has a, a similar kind of problems. A lot of the data that they capture, although um, all the analysis and so on is, is pretty much kept within your Google Analytics account, um, a lot of that data feeds into Google's other services. And it's very hard to, to know what happens to it. 
And because it's hard to know, it means that you can't say where this piece of data has gone that you've captured via your site. Um, and because of that lack of accountability, there's going to be some kind of problem there. The other thing is that it's extremely likely that they ship it outside the EU. And while Google have signed up for the uh, Privacy Shield thing, it's like, well, what happens if that collapses now? Uh, you know, suddenly you're, you've got this sort of um, non-conformity with, uh, with the, the law. Um, but there are alternatives to that. There are ways that you can still do all that kind of analytics, but while preserving privacy, for example, by hosting itself using services like Pwik, um, which it might not be quite as fully featured, but it does mean that you retain full control over it. Social logins. This is something that I find extremely irritating. Never, ever use a login with Facebook. Um, for the best example of this was Pokemon Go when it launched. I don't know if you heard about this. Okay, it was a massive success. It had millions and millions of users. Um, and you signed in using your Google account. But the problem is, when you sign in with your Google account, you granted them full admin rights to your Google account. <laughs> for like, you know, they did this for like 100 million people. Um, the thing is, the potential for abuse there is absolutely massive. Uh, and bear in mind that Pokemon Go. It, it wasn't just that you know they'd messed up talking to Google. They are Google. It's the same company. Um, they should have known precisely what they were doing, especially when they're operating at that kind of scale. And and they'd done it before because they they had the Ingress game that the, the same developers were were really behind. Um, so that was a, a pretty feeble excuse. So that was a really good example of a lack of privacy by design. Um, they really needed to think about that harder before pushing something quite that large live. Um, another good example, buying mailing lists. Just don't do it. <laughs> um, pretty much everywhere, this, this comes back to the problem I was saying before of, of not being able to say exactly where this data came from and, and whether you can actually validate the consent um, under which it was obtained. Uh, this, is, this is hard to do. Um, and finally, I've just got a, a little example of a, um, of a website of the form I came into. This is a, this is a law firm that specializes in advising on data protection and privacy laws. And this is their sign-up form for their newsletter. <coughs> now, you can probably see a few problems with it already. Um, um, <laughs> it's requiring some unnecessary data. You know, there's lots of stuff here that there are required fields that they do not actually need in order to be able to send you an email. Um, you know, obviously, the one piece of required information is your email address. They don't actually need anything beyond that. They may want more, and there's nothing stopping them from asking for it, but making it compulsory is um, really a bit silly. Uh, and that they don't really have good grounds to do that. <coughs> also, they're, they're handling some of the data inappropriately here. This gender field is a classic example. People get very agitated about gender issues on, on all kinds of services, including the web. And forcing somebody to make a choice that they may not be comfortable in doing or revealing the information at all or that they don't consider themselves in this. So you've got a choice of either not signing up or giving what you consider to be false information. And the thing is that once you've given them this information, they, they go, but this is what you said. Um, and that could apply to any other situation where you're being forced into, into specifying something which isn't actually correct. So this is why it needs to be possible for you to be able to go and amend and delete your own information because they may be handling it incorrectly. Um, they're requiring pointless data, really. They're, why do they need your postal address to send you email? I mean, admittedly, they don't say that it's required, but uh, they're, they're basically they're just trying it on here. Um, and in many ways, actually asking for so much data for something so straightforward is uh, a potential turn-off anyway. Um, they'll be likely uh, um, losing potential subscribers for this. And the other thing is that fundamentally, this is a company specializing in data protection and privacy. This is really not the kind of image that they should be pushing. Anyway, there are plenty of resources on GDPR. The, um, that first site there is a... Uh, uh, a really nicely formatted full text of the whole GDPR um, regulation, um, fully hyperlinked and probably in multiple languages. Um, the UK Information Commissioner, Com Commissioner's website um, has some really good documentation, some clear summaries of the kind of things that you need to do, um, um, templates for, for processes and documents. 
Um, and similarly, the Irish Data Protection Commissioner site is really good. This is one of the great things with the GDPR. It means that you can get this information from pretty much any country in the EU, and it's all going to be essentially the same. Um, it's not subject to all this, this inconsistency that has been in the past. Um, you need to be careful, a lot of this kind of fake news stuff going on around the GDPR. There's people that are trying to make it um, sound much worse than it is, and they're also going to try and flog you compliance solutions, which are just going to be a, a losing strategy. You don't, don't go there. Um, the EDPL site, the Euro Data Protection Law site, that's got some really good practical guides and some nice process templates for PIAs, DPIAs, and so on. And that's also that's the link for the Privacy Shield site where you can go and check up on the status of US com of companies doing that. There's a whole bunch of people on Twitter. Um, some of these are really quite fun. Uh, the thing is that because of all this hype and, and misinformation going on, there's some great hashtags as well. There's hash GDPR, which is on everything. But there's also hash GDPR rubbish, which has got some, sort of, some of the more outlandish claims get tagged with this, and they're quite funny. Some of these, some of these Twitter accounts are very opinionated and very... Um, going for some of this misinformation in quite an aggressive way, but it's fun to watch. Anyway, so um, that's all from me. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, any questions? Ooh, lots. What, what constitutes evidence of how you obtain personal information? Um, well, if you obtain something from, say, from a web form, you'd need to give the URL of the web form and maybe uh, the IP address that was used to submit it. Um, and we, I, when I do it, I capture the user agent string. Um, figure that it's available information, and it's, it's a useful identifier. Um, but it, uh, it said this doesn't, this doesn't just apply to web stuff. It applies to, to paper-based processes as well. So uh, it's, it's difficult to know precisely. This is one of the things. I'm a developer. I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> Um, in, the, in the middle there. Yeah. Um, if you want to make absolutely sure uh, that you've got the information um, that you need to, to establish consent. If you're not sure, there's nothing preventing you from asking them. And uh, one of the things that's actually specifically suggested for, for the use of mailing lists is reasonably frequently, say twice a year, um, ask people if they want to stay on the mailing list. Now, marketeers will hate this <laughs> because it means that people fall off their lists because you get people that don't open stuff, don't click stuff. But the thing is, if they're not opening it and not clicking it, they're not interested anyway. So the only thing that they're trying to do is inflate their numbers. Um, this is something we find a, a bit of a hard sell to our own customers. Uh, they're going, yes, like, we can help you send to less people. Uh, it's not really a winning sales pitch. But, um, but the key thing is, is that you're going to be sending to people that do care and are interested, not the people who don't care. So uh, if it's critical to you, then ask is, is the real thing there. And the other thing is check that you do actually require consent for the specific things that uh, that you that you think that you need. Um, quite possibly, yeah. You need to check the check the GDPR documentation. <laughs> The other thing, some, some of the language in the GDPR is all very, uh, somewhat legalese. It's not quite an easier read as things like the UK Data Protection Act. Um, but fortunately, there's plenty of good analysis on, on some of the sites that I mentioned before. Um, you can find some, some good discussions of precisely what certain things mean. Um, and they'll go into much more depth on things like that. Um, there are some differences with that. Uh, I'm not entirely sure off the top of my head, but there are definitely some differences about who exactly has jurisdiction. Um, yeah. it, this is, it is mainly concerned with, with the, the public in general rather than employees. Um, one at the back. 
any additional legislation that they, they introduce will be more about fine detail. The actual principles of it will still be the same across the whole of the EU. So they might just be clarifying certain aspects of it. If they don't think the GDPR quite defines things as tightly as they want to be handled in Germany, um, then they would clarify that in their own laws. However, they're not allowed to effectively um, override or remove some of the parts of the GDPR. Um, so the thing to do there is actually go and look at the individual legislation and see, see if that is significant. But for the most part, if you just look at the GDPR itself, that should be, for the most part, all you need to really worry about. <laughs> well, the thing is, people are entirely allowed to consent to all kinds of stupid things. <laughs> it's like, I promise that, you know, in one week's time, you can have my left arm. You know, that people can consent to anything. And if you've asked them, and they have, this, this clear, informed thing. It's like, this is what we're going to do, this is how we're going to do it, this is, this is when we're going to do it, this is who's going to do it, you know, all these things. If you've, after all that, if you've gone, yes, I'm, I'm up for that, um, then that is kind of their problem. But you do need to make sure that it is very clear what it is that they agree, are agreeing to. The, one of the problems is the kind of the, the, what we call the click wrapping on the, on the end user license agreements. That's something that's had real trouble in, in several court cases um, where people are just going like, yeah, just click the box, do that, whatever. Um, so there, there's been a certain shift to trying to make sure that, that people have in fact read these things um, and that, that they really are aware of the, of the things that they're agreeing to. Um, so having, having readable terms and conditions is a very good idea, but having complicated and unreadable ones is possibly, um, is especially if they're unreasonable terms and conditions, are actually very likely to be struck down in court anyway, so there's not really much point in trying to make them. Um, but a typical user probably wouldn't know that. <laughs> right. um, Um, well, that would probably, for the most part, that would probably fall into the kind of the anonymized data, is that you're going to be losing all the individual identifiers of people. However, the thing is that there, there are some really subtle things that people do with this anonymized data that effectively allows them to de-anonymize it. Um, and you, you need to tread really carefully about this. And th there's been a lot of talk about um, this thing of uh, is it IBM getting hold of um, UK NHS data for, for trying to do kind of AI style analysis on, um, on patient records and so on. But the thing is they just kind of said, oh yeah, here's the data, off you go. Um, and there wasn't really much in the way of consultation before they, they allowed this kind of sensitive data to get out. Even though they anonymized it, there's, there's anonymization and there's anonymization. There's some of it that which you can effectively undo um, by implication, you know, if, they, if you're looking at people that have a certain disorder in a certain region of the country, that might actually already cut you down to a really small number of people. Um, and it doesn't take much for a few other identifiers from other locations to actually, sort of, if you cross them all over, then you find out that, you know, it's that person. Um, so the kind of inferring identity from, from uh, related data can be quite tricky. So it varies. <laughs> more? I think everybody's, oh, we've got last one. Everybody's hungry. One last one. You don't necessarily have to do that immediately, so long as you have a process to make sure that, that data that is effectively being removed from your system because it's no longer relevant or has expired its, its uh, stated purpose and so on, that that data will eventually fall off from those, from those backups and things. Um, but again, if you do things like, so long as you're doing things like uh, encrypting backups, then you're much safer from that point of view. But yeah, but just being aware that that data actually exists is like the big step, really. <laughs>
a lot of the time people just capture stuff and it's like, oh, well, we might have that data somewhere. Um, you, know, there's, you need to just be aware of where all this data is and, uh, and where it might be going. Because well, if you don't know where it is, then you don't know that you can get rid of it. So anyway, that's all. Thank <laughs> you.